The BRICS block of emerging economies just got bigger. Five new members have joined the China-dominated grouping, among them Saudi Arabia, Iran and Ethiopia, but not Argentina, who pulled out at the last minute. We'll get into that and plenty more on this subject with my guest, Guntram Wolf, economist at the German Council on Foreign Relations. Thanks a lot for being with us. Is this a big moment for the existing and new members of BRICS? Well, look, I think for the BRICS, um, it's been always a concept to, yes, to expand and to be some, some sort of a counterweight to the G7. And so, yes, having three countries joining is an important moment for uh, the BRICS. Yeah, so let's have a look at the expansion itself then and how BRICS has developed since its inception back in 2009. Originally, it was just Brazil, Russia, <laughs> India and China in what was just called BRIC. South Africa then joined a year later to add the S to the end. And as of January, the first of this year, five new members have joined. Oil-rich Saudi Arabia, Iran and UAE, as well as Egypt and Ethiopia in Africa. And Argentina, you can just see in dark grey here. That's because it initially was part of the plans to expand, but pulled out last minute. So Guntram Wolf from the German Council on Foreign Relations. What does this expansion mean for the stated aims of BRICS and that, that counterbalance that it wants to provide to the West? Well, look, when you, when you look at the map, I think the first thing that you notice is that the countries that joined are oil producing countries, right? I mean, there's Saudi Arabia and Iran. I mean, these are two major oil producing countries. And you might wonder, why do these two countries join BRICS? And uh, the obvious explanation is that, of course, uh, they look towards Asia, and in particular, they look towards China as a major purchaser, as a major buyer of their oil. Um, their oil increasingly is exported in that region and not um, to the West. The West, we want to green our economies, we get out of fossil fuels, the Americans produce their uh, oil themselves. So for them, it's really a good opportunity to really forge new alliances. And these new alliances are alliances that are primarily based on commercial interests, um, but, you know, that also have this philosophical shared um, uh, sense of, you know, we just don't want to be just subscribed under a Western-led rules-based order. We want to have our own order. But does this come at the expense of their relations with, for example, the EU and, and the United States? And are they, in a sense, endorsing the other members of BRICS, among whom are, of course, Russia, mm -hmm. who invaded uh, Ukraine? Well, I, I think what unites these countries is certainly um, their will not just to uh, subsume and subscribe to the Western-led order, but they are not at the same time in clear opposition to the Western-led order. And if you look at Brazil, for example, Brazil, a major economy that wants to trade with everybody essentially in the world, that wants to trade with the US, that wants to trade with the EU, is now negotiating still the Mercosur trade agreement, but it also wants to, uh, of course, trade with, with China. So, so the risk, I mean, from a Chinese perspective, they really want BRICS to be basically their uh, shop, their alliance. But from the perspective of many countries, including Saudi Arabia and um, Brazil and South Africa, obviously, this is just another uh, sort of piece in a puzzle of having more relations with more partners. One of the big winners, though, does appear to be Iran, doesn't it? Which is now being welcomed into a fold at a time when the US is continuing to try to isolate that country. Yeah, look, I think Iran um, is clearly a, a very, very difficult and real complicated state. It's uh, supporting terrorism around the world. Um, it is supporting, of course, Hamas and um, Hezbollah um, against Israel. So the West is trying to push back against, against Iran. But at the same time, uh, Iran uh, does have something that a lot of countries look for, and that is oil. And China, of course, does look for the cheap oil that it gets out of Iran. And yes, in that sense, it's a blowback to the West that Iran 
has managed to re-establish and strengthen its relation with China in particular. There's clearly a big Middle Eastern presence in the, the, the countries that have, have joined among those five, but we've also got two countries uh, in Africa, Egypt and Ethiopia. What do we read into, for example, Ethiopia being on this list? Well, I mean, I, I, I would have had a, a good answer for, for Egypt. I mean, Egypt um, uh, is clearly looking to, uh, to Europe and it is looking uh, to China, uh, both for renewable energy, for green hydrogen production, for exporting and importing um, food, grain. Um, I mean, this is, um, this is a country that clearly um, needs financing. It has an external funding deficit that is major. Um, and I think uh, uh, Egypt is afraid that the West could dictate too strongly um, the conditions on, on the country um, uh, in terms of funding and is hoping to diversify funding sources. But I think what many of these countries will see is that, um, you know, becoming a debtor to China is actually not such a good deal in so many respects. In fact, um, China is very, very tough as a as a creditor, as a, as a, as a uh, credit giver, and you know, really uh, imposes very tough restrictions. Um, so in that sense, I think there will be a lot of awakening. But for them, I mean, also for Ethiopia, this is really a way of diversifying their external relations and thereby increasing the leverage they have relative to um, all the other, uh, to, to each um, big power, including Europe, the US and China. We should, of course, talk about Argentina, who right on late December were on the list of countries that were going to join on January the 1st, but in the end pulled out under their new president, Javier Millet. Um, what do we glean from the fact that they have withdrawn from this? Is this a major foreign policy shift? Yeah, I mean, for, for Argentina, it's a big shift. Argentina... Uh, was uh, a country uh, under Fernandez that um, wanted to join and uh, under Millet, um, it doesn't want to join anymore. So that's a big shift. Um, at the same time, uh, Millet has now decided that he uh, wants to support um, the membership in Mercosur EU trade agreement. Um, so the wants to support the trade agreement between Mercosur and the EU. And so in that sense, um, it is, I would say, a shift, a Western shift, uh, but it's also um, sort of one because uh, in many respects, Millet does not represent um, a lot of the Western values. Um, it's rather uh, a, a very liberal, um, right, right-leaning government, but clearly one that doesn't want to be in, the, in a club of, of China, but wants to subscribe to a market economy. And in that sense, that's positive news for um, Western-led market economies. Yeah, it'd be interesting to be privy to the conversations taking place in Washington about how Argentina's strategy is changing. But let's talk about Brussels and Washington and how they might view the expansion of BRICS. Is it enough for them to be worried about? Well, there is some worry. Uh, I think the key question that um, is now being discussed in the corridors of power in these two capitals is, is basically what is it that we can offer so that these countries um, stay um, aligned and stay interested in uh, not only Western values, but really also commercial interests. So it's really the question is, do, do we ha still have something to offer um, to the so-called global south? I mean, this is sort of a buzzword. We like to say, yes, we need to support the global south. We need to have relations with the global south. But what is it actually that we offer and that we want to concretely bring to the table to these countries that is in their interest, but that's also in our interest? And, you know, there's not so many concrete policy ideas that, that are out there. I think perhaps the most concrete one is uh, more collaboration on uh, climate policies, funding for um, climate mitigation measures, uh, funding for um, innovation in climate policies. Uh, so really, it's um, I think that's the key area where we can advance uh, collaboration. And the other one is, of course, trade. So access to our markets. And there, 
we tend to be actually much more restricted than we, we should be, in particular when it comes to agricultural markets. Um, so food and food uh, imports are still quite heavily uh, taxed um, at the border. And I think there we need to learn that we need to open up our trade, our, our internal market. Um, it's good for us. Um, it's good for them uh, because that's where uh, a country like Egypt and Ethiopia can develop. Um, it's not going to be on, uh, and Brazil, of course, um, it's not going to be on, on high tech um, immediately. So I, I think this is really the opportunity, but you have to overcome uh, opposition of vested interests, in particular, the domestic farmers that, um, as you know, have a tendency to go to the capitals, not only in Paris, but also actually now in Berlin, uh, driving with tractors through the capital um, to fight for their narrow interests, um, but actually arguably against the interests of, of our countries as a whole. Yeah, this is kind of a battle almost between democracy and other forms of government, isn't it, in that, in that respect? It's that actually the EU and the United States are having to battle with their own checks and balances in a way that some of the states perhaps aren't. You know, before these six countries, including Argentina, were invited to join BRICS, some 40 countries expressed an interest in joining. I think 25 formally applied. That seems like a lot of countries. Should we expect to see BRICS getting even bigger? Well, I mean, I, I do think actually the answer is, is yes. Um, and why is the answer yes? Well, it's basically a simple reflection of the fact that China's weight in the global economy is increasing. And of course, everybody makes its own calculus and, and sort of understands that um, you don't just want to be trading with with the West. You, you do want to trade uh, with China um, and the major economies of Asia. And as China's weight is increasing, um, there will be a tendency to, uh, you know, uh, join initiatives where China play play a major plays a major role. Um, so I think that will that's that will be the reality um, because you know many countries just cannot afford to say okay, I mean, uh, and including our own economies uh, to just sort of say okay, we, we're going to sacrifice the benefits of trade. We're going to sacrifice. Um, on um, our economic development just for the sake of, um, you know, some uh, alliances or some values um, that in the end um, don't really help when you are a poor country, right? I mean, as a poor country, you do want to trade, you do want to develop, uh, you do want to uh, sort of make a living um, and see your own population strive. And for that, you need economic engagement with the West and also with China. Yeah, it's, it's tricky, isn't it? It's a tricky balance that needs to be struck during 2024 and beyond for these countries. Guntram Wolf from the German Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you so much for joining us and bringing your insights on this. Thank you very much, Rob, for having me. And thanks also to you for watching. There's plenty more from the DW Business team here on the DW News YouTube channel. So we'll see you over on whatever you choose to watch next. Take care.